Thank you so much for making it to our last, our last session. Oh my goodness, it's gone by so fast. Um, but certainly last but not least, we have our Future of the Genre, What's Next panel. Um, so a great note to be uh, sending us all off on. Um, I'm going to introduce our moderator for this session and they will introduce uh, our esteemed panelists. Lisa Runquist. Lisa Runquist is an associate professor of art history at the University of North Carolina, Asheville, specializing in modern and contemporary art and theory. Her current book project, The Power and Fluidity of Girlhood in Henry Darger's Art, analyzes representations of little girl protagonists in Darger's work through thematic analyses of the artist's writings, mature works, collages, and ephemeral materials. I feel like I'm not close enough to the mic. Runquist's works, on, excuse me, Runquist's work on the art of Henry Darger speaks to the intersections of childhood, religious piety, gender, and race. New directions in her research explore curatorial strategies that construct the representation of marginalized artists and their artistic practices specifically those categorized as self-taught and outsider. Lisa's curatorial projects include Betwixt and Between, Henry Darger's Vivian Girls, which was uh, presented at Intuit in 2017, and Social Geographies, Interpreting Space and Place, which was presented at the Asheville Art Museum in 2014, featuring also the work of Henry Darger, Thornton Dial, Minnie Evans, Lonnie Holly, Martine Ramirez, and George Widener. Prior to her current position, Lisa completed her doctorate at UNC Chapel Hill in 2007 and was curator at the South Bend Art Museum from 1990 to 2000. Please join me in welcoming Lisa Reinquist. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's have our panel come on up, please. So I'm one of the academics in the room. Um, there's another one on our panel. But I'm also a collector and have been a collector. Uh, my whole family collected antiques and other kinds of objects and art. So um, all these uh, discussions today are near and dear to my heart. Uh, and one of the things I do as a professor is kind of keep an eye on the museum culture. Um, so I'm going to um, begin with just a little bit of, of some thoughts on what's happening now. So in recent years, we've seen an unprecedented interest in outsider and self-taught art by influential mainstream institutions. For example, New York's Museum of Modern Art received a gift of 13 drawings from the estate of Henry Darger in 2012. Since then, the MoMA has featured Darger's art alongside contemporary artists and thematic shows, the latest being the 2016 Soldier, Specter, Shaman, the figure in the Second World War. <clears throat> Excuse me. Likewise, the Metropolitan Museum of Art acquired a gift of 57 works from the Souls Grown Deep Foundation in 2014. The exhibition of this, gifted, of this gift titled History Refused to Die closed in September at the Met. And very recently, Between Worlds, The Art of Bill Trailer, a retrospective featuring 155 works by the artist opened at the Smithsonian American Art Museum and will run through March of 2019. The embrace of outsider and self-taught art by the MoMA, Met, and Smithsonian, among others, signals an integration of non-mainstream expressions into contemporary art and culture. But more importantly, it establishes cultural value for the genre on a larger and deeper scale. Inside and outside conversations are also happening in the arenas of preservation, neurological diversity and mental health, civic engagement, and the art market. What does all this mean for the future of the genre? Our panelists, Carl Hammer, Janine Whitfield, Randy Vick, and Laura Bickford, will speak to this future as it pertains to their personal interests and respective professional fields. So we're going to start with Laura Bickford. She is the assistant curator at the John Michael Kohler Art Center. Professionally, she has been involved in the transition uh, of private collections and artist-built environments into the public sphere. 
working with the Souls Grown Deep Foundation and the Wallace Simpson Whirligig Park, among others. Please welcome Laura. And I also have a like podium paper background, so I'm gonna come up here. Uh, <laughs> And I'm speaking here today after being at the Kohler Art Center for a little over a month. So I'm a new employee, really excited about my position, but I'm also a super fangirl of artist-built environments. And so I'm speaking about the future of both our collection, but also I think the potential for scholarship and preservation conversations to deepen and expand. I've known about the Kohler since 2007 when Leslie Umberger's amazing show Sublime Spaces and Visionary Places was there, and I was an undergrad at UNC. And that catalog blew my mind and changed a lot of my thinking about art, um, artist practices, artist studios, artist homes, and I always wanted to get back to the Kohler. So I'm so pleased and excited to have been brought onto the team to work towards the opening of the Art Preserve in 2020. And I just want to say also my director, Sam Gatmeyer, is here, and he's been working on this project much longer than a month. And so when we do question and answers, we might hopefully do like a tag team if there's something very specific that Sam can answer. And so here, this is a photo of the Kohler Art Center. I've, none of you have never been. It's two hours with traffic and the construction, like three hours uh, north of here. And I encourage all of you to come. If not now, after this, then definitely in 2020 when we open the new building. Uh, so our holdings of artist-built environments are vast, comprised of over 20,000 objects from 35 different environment builders that we've been collecting since the 1980s. And I'm sure many of you here know what an artist-built environment is, but I don't want to assume. So I'm going to start uh, with the definition that I really like from Lisa Stone. And she writes, two of the characteristics that come to define an artist-built environment are an extended artistic creation of interrelated elements as opposed to discrete works of art standing alone, and an artistic creation which occupies a specific place, an exterior landscape, an interior space, or both, whose content and meaning is derived from the spatial context or relationship of components to each other and to their location. In some instances in our collection, uh, we own the entire output of an artist's lifetime, even the structure that the environment would have originally existed in. In some instances, we have examples of work from environments that are still extant. As you can see here, some Fred Smith, we saw some photos yesterday of the park that still exists in Philip, and we have components that were either ancillary, couldn't be saved um, in the original location and had to be moved, or representation of work that wasn't necessarily part of the environment but was sa a side of the artist's practice. And when I go through this presentation, I'm gonna talk about um, our collection and some of the ways that the objects in there exist in relation to the sites and then what that will mean for their long-term life in the art preserve, but I'm not gonna go that much into specifics of the sites, but there's a ton of people here that could talk about that and we can go into that more after. Um, and such is the case of most institutions. A lot of our collection exists most of the time in storage. This is a photo of one area of our storage, and so it's not open to the public, and a lot of people can't see it most of the time. And the exposure to art, artist-built environments and education around them and their preservation has always been a huge priority of the John Michael Kohler Art Center, and it's long been thought that we should have a way for people to see our collection all the time. And a visible storage facility has been in the works for many years, but it's now happening, and in the summer of 2020, we're gonna open the Art Preserve, which will be a 54,000 square foot, three-story building with curated visible storage and exhibition space. And there'll be 13 major environments that are gonna be sort of the anchors, but all 35 collections, and maybe more, will be there um, on view all the time. And it's gonna be, the John McCullough Art Center will still exist and still host exhibitions and programming. This is gonna be a second, a second space with our storage and then also exhibition, education space, um, a research center, a conservation center, really a hub for education and scholarship around artist-built environments. Um, here's another view of storage, some neck chans in our storage. Uh, and in the past, the exhibitions at the Art Center have been used to explore different facets of collections. Um, so like in the 2017 exhibition of neck chans work called The World in a Garden, it paired most of our holdings, although not all of them, with the research of an architectural historian named Ian Jackson, and we utilized his site drawings to really explore the garden's relationship to the geography and topography of Chandigarh. Um, because the site is still extant, we didn't want to replace the site or not 
acknowledge the site was still there, but wanted to explore, use the exhibition space to explore a component of the site. And here's, this is an installation view of that exhibition, and you can sort of see the echoing of the topography and really trying to get that sense that Ian worked through into the exhibition. And so we took this exhibition, and this is a rendering of what it will, this is another view of the exhibition. And then here's a rendering. Um, I just have to say these renderings were done uh, before the building started, so I've been told don't hold us to these. This is just an example of, of what the sorts of things we're thinking through and looking at. Um, and so using that exhibition as a starting point, the Art Preserve is going to take a really similar approach and, you know, using, it'll be situated in such a way that the sculptures will continue to interact with the landscape outside of the preserve, really drawing on the research that Ian did and the things that were explored in the exhibition. This is another example of an environment in our collection where the original environment is no longer extant and we have a vast majority of the holding of the components that were there. Um, and in this exhibition in 2017, Mythologies, Eugene von Brunkenhain, our curator Karen Patterson really wanted to give viewers the experience of walking into the home and that sense of discovery. And so she wanted to place the objects in our collection within the exhibition in ways that were direct references to their original placement. And so here's a part of the exhibition where the facade was recreated with objects that would have been outside and on the facade of the home. Now in other cases, site views like this photo, were used to create tableaus that could give the sense of the relationship that von Brunkenhain established within his home, both between individual objects and then the different locations in the house. And so, for example, this is an installation in the show that relied on photos like that to create this sort of tableau to really give a sense of how the objects would have existed. And in the Art Preserve, we're really going to look to combine this experience of discovery and exploration with functional storage, functional storage that in a lot of ways is going to maintain a verisimilitude to the original site. So here, Dr. Smith's works in storage, uh, which is not where they like to be. Um, and so this is another interesting example in which all of these holdings were from the original Aurora site. Um, and now, as Dr. Smith talked about this morning, is at work on his new site in Hammond. And so this is an interesting collection in, it's the largest holding of work from that ham, from the Aurora site, and it's, um, the Art Center has done several exhibitions in the past that seek to explore different aspects of the Aurora site. Here's some photos, there's been four exhibitions so far. Um, Concrete Ideas was in 2003, uh, which is on the bottom left, and that was to sort of introduce the collection to the Art Center. Um, also in 2003 was History Lessons, which explored the educational and narrative components of the work. Um, there was The Ties That Bind, which dealt with the familial relationships in his work, and then most recently on the bottom right is Things Are What We Encounter, which was a collaboration done with an artist named Heather Hart about the spaces and interactions that the work can afford. But the Art Preserve is going to afford us to be able to put all 200 sculptures out at once in a way that's never been done before and really use them as the educational tools that they were intended. And so that's one example of how, for the first time, visitors will be able to see the entirety of a collection and really giving it the nod that it was intended to have. Um, another collection in our care that represents a sort of different kind of stewardship is uh, the collection of carved birds from Albert Zahn's Bird Park that was in Bailey Harbor, Wisconsin from 1924 to 1950. And the house is still there, but all of the sculptures have been moved off it, although his grandson Randy still makes birds sort of in the style. And so there's a really interesting play that can be talked about there. Um, so most recently at the Kohler Art Center in 2017, as part of the big road less traveled series that a lot of these exhibitions come from. Um, there's a show called Folk and Fable, Levi Fisher Ames and Albert Zahn plus Faith Levine. And this is an example where the work was installed in a way to evoke its original location on the house, not a direct copy, but a sort of recreation, um, an interpreted recreation. Um, and here's a rendering of in the preserve, we'll actually be able to create a facade um, and put the birds back on the facade a mix of things, I can't say too much, but um, you have to come and see, a mix of things, um, so you'll really be able to get a sense of the way that the sculptures in the house interacted. 
and interplayed. And similarly, in that same exhibition, the work of Levi Fisher Ames, who was an itinerant musician, storyteller, artist, and he carved hundreds of these wooden shadow boxes that are hinged, and they have both um, real, real animals and then also some folk tales. Um, and they all normally live in the boxes that you can see on the stage, which he also made and were what he would carry around in. And we choose to store them in there because they're so perfectly fit that when the small boxes are in the big boxes, they're totally immobilized and it's dark, but that way no one ever gets to see them. Um, and so again, this is a blueprint plan in the art preserve. They'll all be able to be out all the time and we're gonna put them in an area with a stage so that uh, we'll have performances and they'll be utilized around, surrounded by music, which is how they were originally done with Levi Fisher Ames. So again, here's another rendering. Um, should get you excited. There will not be alone blagged in by itself. I was very, made to be very clear. That's not how it will look, um, but this is just to give people an example. Um, we did break ground. A lot of people have asked if we've broken ground. We have very much broken ground. You can go up to the third floor. This is a photo of this from a few weeks ago, so it looks even more advanced than this. Um, we're gonna take occupancy in the summer of 2019, and then it will be open to the public August 27th through 29th, 2020, and there'll be tons of celebrations and exhibitions, and so I hope that all of you will come and we'll see you all there. So put this date on your calendar, and we look forward to seeing you in Sheboygan. Thank you, Laura. Our next speaker is Randy Vick. Randy is a professor and chair of the Department of Art Therapy at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He's also a registered and board certified art therapist and licensed counselor. A focus of his research is the relationship between art from outside the cultural mainstream in connection to art therapy and studios for artists with disabilities, including Project Onward, where he serves as an advisor. Thank you. Uh, welcome everybody, good afternoon, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm going to share with you an idea um, that I refer to as art from the outside, as a kind of a model that I've developed to better understand the various origins of work within this genre. In reviewing the various attempts to categorize this art, I've identified these five realms as overarching themes in this history. Uh, outside the salon, refers to work created outside of the gallery um, world and the commercial art world. Outside the canon refers to that a historical quality where they, these artists are not working in response to art history. Um, art side, outside the academy, the idea of self-taught, um, so the idea of uh, people working outside of formal art training. Outside the society, which recognizes the uh, various forms of social exclusion that's often part of the biography of these artists. And for today specifically, I'm going to talk about this notion of outside the norm, which uh, deals with aspects where um, artist bios diverge from the standards of uh, uh, general mental and physical health. In practice, uh, these are not mutually exclusive categories and they do uh, often overlap. The final realm is the most relevant uh, to my career, uh, my clinical career, and will focus on today's talk. While I am an art therapist, I'm not interested in this work for diagnostic or direct treatment purposes. Um, through my training, service, experience, and scholarship, I see connections between my profession and the various aspects relating to this art, these artists, the context of production, and the interest it stirs in viewers. So examples here, uh, Alois Corbaz and uh, Paul Duham, and, uh, and then Ray Mattersons, whose work uh, uh, was created during his time in prison. Uh, let me actually stay on that for a while. Um, aspects of neurodiversity relating to psychiatric, developmental, and intellectual disorders are, have been recognized standards um, within clinical practice, um, while social issues such as trauma and profound isolation uh, may be more difficult to grasp. 
Um, in our society, we tend to think of mental health and educational settings as places where people living with these circumstances receive services, or at least we hope they receive services, but increasingly correctional, correctional institutions and systems are involved as well. For example, our own Cook County Jail uh, is considered to be one of America's largest mental health facilities with one third of the inmates having psychological um, histories. Mental, physiological, intellectual, behavioral, cultural and social dimensions can and do overlap in complex cause and effect fashion. Uh, two artists that will be familiar to you, most of you will recognize the work of Adolf Wolfli on the left and Martin Ramirez on the right as archetypal examples of outsider art. Uh, residing uh, a world apart, both had similar stories. Uh, uh, living the first half of their lives in their communities and then spending the last 30 years or so in psychiatric hospitals. Uh, while there, uh, each began to produce what would become a massive body of work that is still admired today. Uh, less familiar may be this drawing by Gottfried Mind, who lived in 19th century Switzerland. Uh, despite significant intellectual limitations, his tiny meticulous drawings, particularly those of felines, earned him the nickname Der Katzen Raphael or the Raphael of Cats. Um, the drawings and writings found in Henry Darger's realm of, Realms of the Unreal have sealed his place in the pantheon of quote unquote outsider artists. His sad reclusive life and poverty confirm a veneer of otherness uh, which is seen by some as a confirmation of his outsider status. These four artists exemplify profiles classically encountered in this genre. Certainly traumatic, psychosocial, and other, quote, clinical circumstances can alter perceptions and focus, uh, perceptions and focus, and can, in turn, contribute to isolated conditions experienced by many potential creators but many others live in similar circumstances yet never produce artwork. Talent, it would seem, is a rare commodity here as it is in other segments of our society. In some ways, this uh, traditional notion of this art has been predicated on Du Buffet's concept of art brute that is entirely pure and somehow untouched, untouched by culture. I don't buy it. I don't buy it then and I don't buy it now. Um, like Agnes Richter's jacket, shown here, preserved in an archival box at the Princehorn Collection, such ideas are relics of another era when patients spent months and years in asylums, relegated to the distant edges of their communities. Happily, changes in society and healthcare mean liberation for individuals who in the past lived out their lives in such institutions. Does this mean that creations by neuroatypical people are destined to become fragile memories wrapped away for safekeeping as well? Well, fear not. <laughs> like many mainstream artists who seek residencies to, uh, to have concentrated time to hone their craft, many of the individuals in this category have found that life-altering circumstances create a time and space in which creation can occur. Um, I liked that conversation yesterday about space. Um, I'm gonna talk about the time piece. For me, this intense framework of creating is a thread that weaves through many of these artists' biographies. In cases such as Wolfley's, this was a hospitalization. But many other conditions seem to evoke creative outpourings as well. James Hampton had a night shift job while simultaneously over a 14 year period in a rented garage in Washington DC created his astonishing throne of the third heaven of the nation's millennium general assembly. A lot of time went in crafting the title I suspect. Um, and someone was talking about, oh, Cleo you were talking about uh, uh, the drawing that's taken the artist 21 years. 
uh, earlier. So this idea of, of, um, of, of amount of time to, de to de dedicate to a body of work or even a single work um, is, is an essential feature of all, for all artists. Uh, when for forced into early retirement for health reasons, Eugene von Brunchenheim launched into an artistic career in multiple and diverse media, creating works such as this chicken bone chair. During years of incarceration, Mark Francis found a way to turn scraps of everyday life into dramatic sculptural vignettes reflecting on his prison life. Uh, Charles Steffen, spent time in a psychiatric hospital, but created the bulk of his drawings working at home in the years after his discharge. If you're interested in Stefan's work at uh, Bridgeport Art Center tonight, uh, there's, a, there's a show there uh, uh, arranged uh, for your enjoyment this evening. All these stories have in common the unintended benefit of time found to create even if the circumstances that established that work time were unwelcome. While long-term confinement in psychiatric institutions is largely a thing of the past, the time and space to create still exists in the, uh, quote, asylum of studios for artists with disabilities. I see these studios as a continuing source of artwork for this genre. Uh, some of the better known examples um, include the uh, Guggen House of Artists outside of Vienna, first established uh, within a state psychiatric hospital, but eventually it became an independent program. So they didn't move away from the hospital, the hospital moved away from them. The rest of the uh, campus of the hospital was turned into a technical college and they stayed on. Um, and in the mid 70s, uh, creative growth in Oakland, California was founded um, and has served as a pioneering example of an independent community-based studio. While I have visited many of these studios, I'm most familiar with Project Onward, a program I have been affiliated with for many years. Um, while it started in connection with a city youth art program, um, uh, it later moved to the Chicago Cultural Center and now resides in a neighborhood art center alongside other studios artists. This uh, stepping stone effect reflects a larger trend of movement from institutions uh, to becoming truly embedded within the community. And so this piece by Adam Hines gives you uh, the address and that's where I hope all of you will come tonight and see the studio. Um, uh, Rob Lentz, one of the founders is here and hey Rob, hey Rob, thank you very much for being here. As with the best of these studios, the staff at Project Onward finds ways to support artists with the time, space, and materials they need, and then steps out of the way to allow the artists to develop their work. Such studios represent the next generation of artists in this genre. And this is literally true in the case of Project Onward where Ricky Willis um, is following the footsteps of his older brother, Wesley. Here's a small example of some of the other artists who are currently working at Project Onward. So from clockwise from the upper left are works by uh, Jano uh, Jagulian, Ruby Bradford, Louis DeMarco, David Holt, uh, Fernando Ramirez, and Jackie Cousins. And more by all of them later on this evening. Um, these studios have also increasingly become places of social action and identity. Here, Stefan Doby uh, uses some of his trademark characters to raise some autism awareness. The very fact that such studios exist, uh, that the artists and their work enter the public sphere and are seen and admired, reflects the larger trends in our society regarding access and stigma. I'll close with an invitation and a shameless pitch um, to visit Project Onward this evening for the after party for this symposium. 
Uh, there we will see firsthand the works by Tony Davis and other artists who are, have been contributing to What's Next. Um, you'll be able to see the work, meet artists, um, and uh, purchase some work if you would like and are smart. And, um, and this is Tony's uh, first single person show. And um, I'm very excited for him. Uh, he's someone I met uh, before uh, he came to Project Onward and was able to uh, introduce him. So for the question of are these artists still out there, um, they are. And um, they're out there making work for your enjoyment. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is Carl Hammer. Many of you know him well um, and have known him for a long time. But for those of you that don't know him well, um, he began um, uh, his kind of quest uh, in this, uh, this journey of, of uh, outsider self-taught art actually as a humanities teacher at Evanston Township High School in the late 1960s. He was collecting what um, he writes here as American folk art in antique shops traveling on the roads of America um, during both winter and summer school vacations. Uh, subsequently, he co-opened Hammer and Hammer American Folk Art Gallery in 1979, located at 620 North Michigan Avenue here in Chicago. Four years later, on the heels of significant national civil rights turmoil, assassinations, and US war involvement, Carl experienced the 1982 landmark Corcoran Gallery exhibition Black Folk Art in America. From that period on, an evolved Carl Hammer Gallery focus resulted. Nearly 100% of the gallery's pursuit and promotion was directed at its discovery and exhibition of a relatively newly coined genre of art called outsider art. Art which was unrelated to the mainstream and stemmed from deeply personal visions which had little or nothing to do with folk traditions. Today, the gallery is known for its juxtaposing the best of outsider art material with work by both established mainstream artists and upcoming discoveries, ranging from mid 20th century to contemporary. Carl. Carl Hammer Gallery has demonstrated its commitment and its resources tied to the promotion and representation of non-mainstream art over the past 40 years. Indeed, I believe it is a safe assumption to make that future recognition for the self-taught outsider artist, artist is already very much on the roadmap for broader interest in developing the scholarship and the collecting of genre of the genre by academic mainstream art establishment and, and gen by the uh, academic mainstream art establishment in general. Excuse me for fumbling around here. Feel a little more comfortable. I turn this this way. Um, I believe this is an especially important course direction for the future of the art world. Being a, a gallerist and seeing both the uh, uh, international and local uh, aspects of, uh, of uh, gallery uh, interaction with uh, both the, um, the mainstream and the, uh, the outsider, it, 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 fe it feels to me that this is uh, an important course direction, as I said before, both local and international, as, as inclusion of essential and historic modes of visual expression that we now realize the non-mainframe body of work to be helps push aside the barriers of both academic and prejudicial restraint, encouraging scholarship for broader understanding and inclusion, an equal understanding, if you will, of the stage uh, in the international art continuum. Over the past 40 years, a great amount of change, no, I need to Yes, okay. A great amount of change has occurred uh, concerning the art world's growing acceptance of and definitions for non-academic art. Indeed, form, uh, former non-acceptance has been replaced by growing disdain for some of the anti-intuitive traditions built up during modern civilization's push towards escalating, uh, educating the masses. Sorry. 
When I first started collecting some 50 years ago, I wasn't clear about how to describe what I liked or what I disliked or what I collected, but I essentially realized that there wasn't really, let me go here, there wasn't really a term, um, let me get, get, getting lost here. I realized there wasn't really a term that a accurately encapsulated all that I was interested in. So for lack of a better term, I and most others called anything that wasn't mainframe art, folk art. Looking back at the early days of Hammer and Hammer American Folk Art, my gallery's initial identity, I recognized the misunderstood significance of an amount of the art we were representing, which was not folk art. My gallery's 1979 grand opening spoke most clearly to, the lack of, uh, to that lack of understanding when, as I walked from my car to my gallery's Michigan Avenue entrance, I met for the first time in my life an artist whose very existence defied such categorization. Lee Goatee, Chicago's al already infamous bag lady artist, stood blocking the entrance to my new gallery home carrying with her two humongous portfolio bags chock full of her latest production of canvases. She, being the French Impressionist of Michigan Avenue, would not let me pass before successfully intimidating me into pur the purchase of some of her most recently produced artwork. Her frequently chanted rant reverberates with me even today. I'm better than Man Monet, Manet, Degas, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Eventually, I came to recognize the full importance of Chicago's infamous bag lady, artist. Some 25 years later, subsequent to our initial brief but consequential encounter, the Carl Hammer Gallery, the Carl Hammer Gallery gave this amazing woman her first bona fide solo gallery exhibition and the 10 canvases which I ended up purchasing. Uh, come on, Carl. I screwed up here. Pushed the wrong thing here. Ah, good. And the 10 canvases which I ended up purchasing from her that evening, they still remain in my collection to this day. As Carl Hammer Gallery began to garner more and more interest from the numbers of fine arts collectors that were constantly in and out of the Breskin building at 620 Michigan, which housed perhaps a dozen or more fine arts galleries during the 70s and 80s, I began to notice an increased amount of interest being paid to us that, were, that, that was not so much by our earlier uh, customer base of folk art and antiques collecting. Most of the, the growing audience of new clients were contemporary fine arts collectors, largely younger collectors, and even more so contemporary artists and School of the Art Institute of Chicago graduates who were inquisitive and more open to the notion of collecting the work by self-taught artists, the new kid on the, uh, or the new art form on the block, often providing an inspiration to their own artwork or to their ideas of collecting. The give and take indicated a growing awareness and acceptance of the uniqueness, inventiveness, and vision of the self-taught artist. In 1984, a very different looking show catalog arrived to my gallery announcing the debut of a new and extremely important groundbreaking exhibition. Organized by Jane Livingston and John Beardsley, who the uh, Intuit knows very well because they, they were here at, uh, a year ago and uh, gave a marvelous presentation of the background of that show. For the Corkin Gallery, um, Black Folk Art in America, 1930 to 1980, led to a revolutionizing of the self-taught art world in a capacity beyond anything anyone could ever have thought before regarding both, of its, both its scholarship advancement and the collecting of work by the self-taught artist. My gallery director at the time, Ken Hodorowski, himself an ardent collector, especially of work by self-taught artists, opened the page of, a, of, a, of the exhibition catalog that had arrived shortly uh, before my arrival there at the gallery 
and, and, and thumb directly to one, uh, the pages to one artist in particular among the others featured in the exhibition, a heretofore unrenowned artist named Bill Trailer. Shoving the catalog into my hands as I looked down at a picture of the artist and the artwork attributed to him, uh, to him, my gallery assistant urgently advised me to get in my car and drive to Montgomery, Alabama that very moment. <laughs> Three weeks later, I did exactly that. I met with Charles Shannon, himself an artist, the, discover, the, the discoverer of Bill Trailer, back in the mid-1930s, and the collector of this prodigious body of work, along with his wife. I explained the mission of my gallery to both, and of my interest in introducing Bill Trailer to the Chicago art collecting world. <coughs> Never was there to be a more sorry. Never was there to be a more important set of consequences influencing me, the direction of the gallery and the art collecting world as all as well. Given the response then and now, some 80 years later, in regards to the recent opening of the superb trailer retrospective at the Smithsonian American Art Museum titled The Art of Bill Trailer, it might, have, it might seem as though I was holding a crystal ball. <laughs> at approximately the same time as the Black Folk Art in America exhibition in 1984, art critic Roger Cardinal co coined the term outsider art, describing the heretofore untitled uh, uh, self-taught genre. It was a new term to which most of the art world now subscribes when describing any, uh, any art defined by Jean Dubuffet as raw art or as art unadulterated by culture. Dubuffet was right on in describing it as such. It is raw because it is creation in its most direct and uninhibited form. In Dupuffet's own words, it was anything produced by persons unscathed by artistic culture where mimicry plays little or no part contrary to the activities of intellectuals. These artists derive everything, subjects, choice of materials, means of trans transposition, rhythms, styles of writing, etc., from their own reserves rather than from the stereotypes of classical or fashionable art. From that point on, historically, that is, the mission for Carl Hammer Gallery became clearer and more dedicated. And I assured, my sh I, and I assured myself that the road r less traveled was the road to follow, at least for the foreseeable future. The gallery's uh, artist roster continued to grow and in turn, both the gallery's vision and direction became one of more clarity and adventure. In 1962, at the age of 76, living alone on the Chicago South Side, Joseph Yoakum began to make drawings under what he called the force of a dream. The Lord gave me instructions, he would say. My drawings are a spiritual unfoldment. Perhaps, too, he felt the need to retrace his life, to find in it some plan to discover his own essential form amid the pressure of circumstances or the circuitous roots and overlappings of his existence. Discovered by Whitney Halstead and avidly collected by a number of Harry Who artists, I better start pulling these down here. Sorry. Um, discovered by Whitney Halstead and avidly collected by a number of the Harry Who artists in Chicago, I was encouraged by my gallery director, again, Ken Hodorowski in 1982, to mount an exhibition of his drawings and his connectedness to several Chicago artists. So Joseph Yoakum, his influence on contemporary art and artists was a landmark exhibition for the gallery and an overdue tribute to the artist and his memory. The exhibition objective was to attempt exploring the relationship of 12 contemporary artists to the work of, of Yoakum and to celebrate the continuing importance that his work had for a growing number of artists, scholars, and admirers. The exhibition idea was as transformational as were the sur surreal landscapes that he drew. For several years prior, most of the same artists exhibit, uh, to exhibit side by side 
with him in this exhibition had collected his work, each recognizing the significant influence this God-inspired landscape artist had on their own work. Exhibiting alongside, alongside this brilliant visionary at 80 years of age provided Chicago artists Ray Yoshida, Jim Nutt, Phil Hansen, Gregory Anima, Amanov, Roger Brown, David Sharp, Christina uh, Ramberg, Carl Wurzum, and others an opportunity of attesting to Yoakum's significance and God-inspired genius. These are some of their works. This is uh, David Sharp's work, Ray Oshita's, Christina's, Roger Brown's. Clearly, many of the Chicago artists who shared Dubuffet's, many were the Chicago artists who shared Dubuffet's premise of recognition and respect for self-taught visionaries like Yoakum. For that, I give credit to their consideration and overall impact on the collecting public. In particular, the Chicago imagists themselves had an immense influence on the shaping of many significant collections in which outsiders now enjoy a major presence. Their work in turn is a visual demonstration of the powerful influence self-taught artists like Yoakum and others had and continue to have on them. Living in the Midwest, and more specifically the city of Chicago, our eyes have been opened by the richness of the discovery and collecting of such artists. Certainly the bounty of what Dubuffet was looking for is as readily available to us as the work by other outsiders as well. And whose creative, ta and whose creative talents are equally as urgent and pure and compelling. At Carl Hammer Gallery, we continue to celebrate their lives their identities and their visions in an ongoing programming commitment wherein the power and beauty of their creation becomes a part of a daily regimen, both challenging and fulfilling. And I will give you some additional images here of the artists that uh, we do represent in the gallery. Mr. Imagination, we all know him, Henry Darger, of course. We had uh, Eugene von Brunchenheim, Simon Sproul, Albert Zahn, Howard Finster, uh, David Philpott, William Dawson, Frank Jones, Wilson Snowflake Bentley, Stick Dog Bob, S.L. Jones, and William Hawkins. Thank you very much. Our last speaker is Janine Whitfield. Janine has served as the executive director of the critically acclaimed Heidelberg Project for 25 years. Under Ms. Whitfield's direction, the Heidelberg Project, founded by Tyree Guyton, has risen to international status and is currently recognized as one of the most influential art environments in the world. Under Whitfield's leadership, the work of the Heidelberg Project spans five continents and has collected over 25 awards locally and nationally. Whitfield is leading the next iteration of the Heidelberg Project, Heidelberg 3.0, as the organization's first CEO. January 2018 marked her first epic achievement in this role, when after decades of contention and controversy, she successfully negotiated a partnership with the city of Detroit. Janine. Well, good afternoon. I'm happy to be here with you, and <clears throat> this is going to be one of the first times that I have ever given a lecture that wasn't directly about the Heidelberg Project. I think that the story between Tyree Guyton and his grandfather is quite remarkable, and it really speaks to the subject of what we're discussing today. The story goes that at the age of nine, Tyree's grandfather, Sam Mackey, gave him a paintbrush and he declared his hand was on fire. And then at the age of 88, Tyree gave the paintbrush or the markers in the crayons back to his grandfather as a way to deal with the death of his wife. And Sam created this amazing body of work from the age of 88 until his death at the age of 94. And Sam Mackey's work is a part of the permanent uh, collection in the Dubuffet Museum in Lausanne, Switzerland. 
Now, what's interesting about Tyree Guyton is that he actually, let's get a slide up here. He actually is a trained artist. He studied at the College of Creative Studies. And I remember when I first met him 25 years ago, I turned on Heidelberg Street and it changed my life. I was a banker, okay, just so you can get a feel for this. And I remember seeing his work, and I really did not think the man was an artist. I thought he was a man who had too much time on his hands. <laughs> and then after about six months, I found paintings that look like what you see here, stuffed in a corner with footprints on them. And I remember asking him, and you know, my gosh, in my own intellect, this is what art was supposed to look like. I said, this is fantastic. Why don't you paint like this? And he said it was because it was too easy. So this just gives you an idea of how Tyree was creating before he started the Heidelberg Project. Beautiful landscapes. But then he moved into this different kind of era. And he said that he took a few of his paintings to his mentor, Charles McGee. Some of you may know him. He's about 94 now. And that Charles McGee took his painting and put it on an easel and just began to mark it up and said, I'm going to have to undo what that institution did to you. And he said, I want you to lock yourself in a room, this is what he said, smoke a joint, <laughs> get naked, and paint. 1986, a year later, the Heidelberg Project was born. So what you're seeing here now is that more loose and fluid kind of uh, concept or, or way in which he decided to create. And what's really interesting is that I look at principles of metaphysics in the work that we do and the end being declared from the beginning. And then what I want to just kind of plant in your mind is that Tyree's grandfather started drawing at the age of 88, at the end of his life. And, you know, oftentimes when we come into the world, we come in with no hair, no teeth, and that's the way we go out. That's my point, the end being declared from the beginning. And as children, when we create, we're loose and fluid, and we just do what we feel. And it's very interesting because that is what Sam Mackey, here we go, his grandfather, begun to do when he created, he reverted back to this childlike quality. And that's what you see on these drawings, and this, is, this became a huge influence uh, on Tyree Guyton's style. And yet Sam's works were very, very sexual. You will always find penises and breasts in his work, cleverly hidden in the work. But to take you back, and my slides are a little bit out of order, so this is what you start to see now. Tyree creates what's known as studies, and he's always created studies even before he created the first house on Heidelberg Street. So that's what you're looking at here. And then he began to move into this face concept. Again, going back to his original premise that creating these beautiful landscapes was too easy. He wanted to find a style that was his own and that came from a place that was not controlled, that was not precise. And then his faces began to move into different dimensions, which really starts, in my opinion, to show his trained talent or his skill, but still having that looseness and the fluidity throughout the work. So this is Ty Tyree's grandfather, Sam Mackey, who also helped him to create the Heidelberg Project when he started in 1986. And the story is, is that Sam was out there climbing up on ladders with Tyree at that age, and he was a man who was still sexually active. When he died, and this is no joke, Tyree used to bring women in for him. But when Sam died, it was as a result of the first demolition of the Heidelberg Project. And the feeling and the, 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 what the doctors suggested is that Sam Mackey actually died of a broken heart. He was a very healthy man. And so when he was in the hospital, he began to paint on the walls. He began to paint everything he could get his hands on. He even began to eat the paint. Sam did. And so when they buried him, they buried him uh, with all of his crayons and markers, but the concept was that he died of a broken heart because he could not understand 
why the city would come in and destroy something that was bringing so many people together in the city of Detroit. So this is his work again. More of Sam. Very childlike, as I said. Only crayons, markers, and ink. And then he introduces this, this other concept. And the truth is, is Tyree and his grandfather never talked about the works. But he began to create these women with these big breasts and these big penises, often because the women in the African American community had to wear the pants. So that was what that concept, where that concept comes from. But then you can see, this is Tyree's image. Now he began to explore that same kind of principle. They, and they, he never saw the works that Sam Mackey created when he began doing these paintings. So once again, you can see on the, your, I don't know what it is, is that your left? The first big mama with the big breasts and the big stomach. But then if you look at the picture right next to it, you begin to see once again this more sophisticated style starting to creep into the work. So then Sam is the one who introduces the house concepts to Tyree. You know, again, creating at the age of 88, and he's just creating these houses, and he's doing all of these people, creating all these people. And then what you start to see is Tyree move into this concept with the study process again. All of these are studies where he's literally creating these houses. Some of this is kind of prophetic because he could not have known when he created the image on fire in the middle that the actual Heidelberg project would, in fact, suffer 12 fires or be on fire. When these artists talk about being divinely inspired, I don't think it's to take it lightly. I think that there is something that's deep and profound about that and what they do and how they produce as a result of that. And so, of course, this leads to the actual creation of what is the first house on Heidelberg Street, which is known as the Fun House. And this was one that was created in 1986 and was one of the first that was destroyed in uh, 1991 by the city of Detroit. If you come to the Heidelberg Project today, you can still see the famous Dottie Waddy house. This is where it all began. This is where Sam gave Tyree the paintbrush. And this house has been in his family since 1947. So his history is literally on that street that he has been creating and working on for 32 years. Another one of the structures that he created, House of Soul, this was destroyed in the fire. And it's funny because I, one of the kids in the neighborhood saw this vinyl, these vinyl albums on this house. And this just goes back to Dr. Smith talking about that education. And the kid says, what CD player do you play those in? And I just thought, wow, you know? So it was an education for them to actually see the vinyl on the house. Happy Feet, again, these were all abandoned structures on Heidelberg Street that Tyree literally transformed into works of art. Very whimsical, very fun-like. The houses were not functional on the inside. It was just a way to bring a positive attention to an otherwise blighted area. And this is the famous OJ house. So what I'm, what I'm really showing is that this concept of what Tyree was learning from his grandfather became more important to him than what he had learned in school. But he took it to a much, much more extreme level. And of course, the uh, party animal. Every house has a story, and it was based on what actually took place in those structures. Because remember, he had lived in the neighborhood since he was born. But then to take it to another level, this is actually celebrating the tricentennial of the Detroit Institute of Arts. And he decided to create a structure, created with a burned kind of effect and the campaign posters that he literally collected from the Heidelberg Project, the same politicians that in fact destroyed his work. So he took those campaign posters and uh, you know, fashioned this structure that we had made 
And on the inside, it was a, a video that, or not a video, but an audio that was recorded their speeches of all the things they didn't do. It was called Open House. And then we're taking to the street now with some of his works, how he transferred many of the images that you saw earlier on paper to the faces in the hood, uh, art that he says speaks to the automobile industry, using the relics within the community to paint these famous faces. These are his most collected works, Faces in the Hood. And then using the whole concept of repurposing materials. Tyree hardly ever works with anything that is new. So what you're seeing in the effect are works that were salvaged from the fires that he then transformed into different works, leaving a part of that rust and burnt effect. So I, you know, most people don't really know his work, and this is what I wanted to bring to you today. So the one with the gun, pistol pack in politics. How appropriate, because that's literally 15 years old. And works that were created in Switzerland uh, on a one-year residency. This is actually monoprints. Clocks, time all themes that were existing on the Heidelberg project. And of course, the man himself, Tyree Guyton, who now is creating a different path for himself, and he's going in a different direction and shows and exhibitions in various places, and uh, leaving me to take the Heidelberg project to the next level, which I'm very excited about because uh, women are ruling this, and I'm very excited about that. Yes, we are. Yep. We're doing the damn thing. And, uh, <laughs> and I thought it was profound that he wanted and willingly handed the baton to me because he felt that I was capable and qualified. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. We have um, lots of time before um, we have a happy hour. So um, we did um, start some Q&A. Um, and if you wouldn't mind, I'd, I'd like to ask the first question. So, you know, the, the theme of our, t of our panel is, you know, what's next in the future? So we've got, you know, Heidelberg Project that is um, working with the city of Detroit. Uh, we have a gallerist up here who has been selling um, contemporary art and outsider art and whatever manifestation we want to call it um, side by side for about 40 years. Um, we have someone who represents uh, one of the successful and um, inclusive kinds of workshops in the city. Um, another person here from a museum that is expanding and starting a you know state-of-the-art kind of preservation center. So are we at this moment where we are truly having conversations between inside and outside? Um, if you think about uh, also the, the exhibitions I mentioned at the very beginning, um, are we at this moment where we're just not preaching to the choir, we're talking to other people that are new to the genre, are getting interested? Um, is this a breakthrough moment? I think that the, personally, the Heidelberg Project embodies all the principles of everything that we've talked about here. And as we think about where we're going with the Heidelberg Project, we're combining artistic practices, both outsider, insider, whatever you want to call it. We're combining art therapy with an institutional partnership with Wayne State University. We're, in, we're bringing social issues into play, and we're in a neighborhood. So I think, for me, what I'm seeing is a shift in the way that we're thinking about art and creativity and the roles, and the lines are blurred as they should be, in my opinion. I, th I think the uh, exhibition in um, Washington, D.C. recently of uh, Bill Trailer's work, again, uh, referring back to that, is rather monumental in the sense that it it, it places him in really the, uh, the forefront of, uh, of some of the very finest artists that have, 
existed in America, and uh, I think that uh, the, the world is acknowledging that uh, on an increased basis. So we're we're seeing many more outsider artists featured in contemporary art galleries that uh, have traditionally shown uh, uh, trained artists and. Uh, I, I'm, I'm also looking at the collections that uh, I've sold to that are, you know, uh, uh, demonstrating that they have a, a fairly broadly represented uh, spectrum of the, uh, of the art scene. So I think it's changing considerably. I mean, there's a long way to go yet, but uh, there are still people that have prejudices perhaps against the, the, the notion that uh, someone outside of the um, academic mainstream is capable of producing significant art. I, I find that hard to believe in the light of uh, some of the the great museum uh, exhibitions recently that have uh, demonstrated otherwise. Um, and on the theme of institutions with prejudices, I mean, I, it's a sad irony for me that the museum that's affiliated with my own school, I'm the Art Institute of Chicago, you can count on one hand and some have fingers left. Um, for uh, exhibitions that featured this kind of work, even though, they, as you've heard from a number of speakers the last couple days, um, a number of faculty and students and former students have been intimately connected with this uh, in Chicago. So, but our, our museum um, is not really opened itself. Um, I, I, there's not one Bill trailer in the entire collection. Well, there may be in the basement somewhere, no, but um, no, yeah. I, I, I mean, there was a Yoakum show and that why, I. Why, why don't they have a Yoakum show? Uh, they did have a small. small one, yeah. Right. There will be. And, okay. <laughs> and, and there was the um, uh, uh, James Castle. Right. Um, and uh, what am I missing? I may not be missing it, that's very sad, but um, so, but then you have museums like the Heidelberg, we heard from Hans yesterday, and I was uh, fortunate to see, um, uh, be there in January at the, in Amsterdam, I was this last January in Amsterdam and saw, um, you know, the permanent dedicated galleries um, uh, in the Hermitage, uh, Amsterdam, and as well as their partnership with uh, um, uh, a studio program just basically outside their back door. And so that's the first I know of that such a major museum has, has that dedicated um, connection. I mean, Lille does as well, but, but then also this connection with a studio program where production is happening um, at the same time. So uh, that's a new element, and I would love to see that in other, some other museums. I'm not going to count on it happening at the Art Institute right away, but... Uh. Um, yeah, I think... Um, I'm sure many of you saw Lynn Cook's show Outliers, which I think did a really good job of showing the moments that this has happened and where there has been this perforation, and that show also largely credited artists for that historically, for being the champions of as artists are close lookers, I think, and generally move about the world in a way that they have eyes to see things that I think a lot of us would otherwise miss. Um, and so I think, I'm not sure that I'm saying, I think generally right now, institutions and not just art institutions, all institutions are being forced to shift and realize that they need to be more nimble. I think a lot of this came up in the conversation we had yesterday about um, young people and the, the way that people are connecting or trying to connect in different ways. And so I think we are in a moment that is exciting. I don't know that it's new. I think it's different and perhaps more meaningful because I think it's coming from a new place and a new energy that's happening all in the art world as well. I think you all have really gotten into the question that we're all thinking about. What is the future? So good job. Good job, Lisa. Good Thank job, you, job, panelists.